Good to see you. Good to see you. How are you? Good. second it is something <laughs> you can text her she'll give it to you because she gave it she's given it to me a bunch of times okay. yeah every now and again I look You don't hear me, right? No. Okay. Two. Okay. Cause some, sometimes he unmutes me and he unmutes the whole, the whole rack, and I'm like, <coughs> now just I can hear myself very quietly. I'm like, hey, turn me off. Okay, I'm going to go check the heat and see what it is.
Good morning. We are gathered here this morning to remember and to celebrate the life and the influence of our beloved Margaret Oliver. Today we are faced with the reality of death and the fragility of life. And all of this is difficult, if not near impossible, for us to bear. But we are assured and we are reassured that when things become too hard to bear, we can turn to God for help and for strength. So let us do so now in prayer. Most gracious God, most wise Father, you are the sustainer and source of life. All things come of thee, O Lord. And God, today we stand in the midst of your sovereign decision to take back unto yourself Sister Margaret Oliver. God, we do not always agree with your decisions. We do not always understand your timing. But do we do trust your wisdom? We do not lean on our own understanding. But we attempt in all our ways to acknowledge you as you direct our paths. Today, God, our hearts are heavy. Heavy because of the weight and the magnitude of Margaret's life. Heavy because she meant so much to us. Heavy because there is a void left with her transition. And God, we ask that you would help us today to honor her life, to celebrate all that she is and was. God, we thank you for this gift that you gave us in Margaret Oliver. God, you are the only person in the universe who gifts us with people. When we are in our deepest and darkest times, you send people. Thank you, God, that you sent this angel from above to be a mother, to be a friend, to be a cousin, to be a daughter, to be a grandmother. Thank you for all that you sent her to do. And God, we know that as she entered those gates, that she received a well done for all the roles she played here on earth. And God, we ask that you would help us to accept what you have done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I mean, we are going to now lift up a hymn together this morning I don't see anybody's name to sing so I think it'll be me singing it with y'all y'all help me sing amen amen Wayne would you give me a key sir and yes sir and your words are in your program so lovely designed by her son Raymond Oliver amen would you stand with us as we sing thank you Jesus is mine, oh what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchased of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood, this is This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, 
praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, filled with his goodness and lost in his love. Come on, church. This is, this is my story. This is my song. Come on, lift it up. Praising my Savior on the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. You may be seated. Blessed assurance. It's one thing to go through life and be unsure but that that's not our song today it's not our story we have assurance next thing for our hearing will be the reading of the scripture first we'll have an old testament scripture the lord sh the lord is our shepherd in psalms 23 the shepherd's psalms by joy johnson also, we hear the New Testament reading in John 14, 1 through 6, by Bar Bartelli. Bija, thank you. Appreciate it. Bart, Bar how do we say the last name? Bartlett. Thank you. You may come to the podium. Thank you. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul and leadeth me into the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Ye though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I would feel no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I go and prepare a place for you. I will come back and 
takes you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. Thank God for the reading of his word. Next, we will have a prayer of comfort by our very own Deacon Janet Jackson. And also following her, we will have a musical selection, How Great Thou Art, by Stephen King, Jr. morning to you all. Margaret Oliver was my friend. She was a consummate social worker. She was skilled and caring and wise. I have known her for as long as her son Raymond has lived. She was out on maternity leave when I came to the adoption team. She worked tirelessly on behalf of children and families at the village. In the latter part of her life, there was another village that came and surrounded her. There were librarians, there were social workers, there were teachers, and there was her union family. I can barely see you, Raymond. I have to stand on my tippy toes but she poured so much into you and she just kept pouring until the day she had no more breath. And you were always quiet until you finally told me we were worrying about a big recliner for Margaret. She wasn't sure you could pull it off, and you told me, I told my mother I would take care of it, and you did, and you did, and I know you're going to keep taking care of it. Your family, all that she dreamed of and wanted for you, because being a mother and a grandmother, Bryce, and a grandmother was probably the most important thing. I've got to mention some of that village that was with her. Lori, you're going to get your wings, Glennis. Kathy, Merlene, and I, I don't know Martha, I don't know everyone, but I know within this union family, there was a village. And so, I'm here to pray, and it's the prayer of comfort, and what I offer to you today is the 121st Psalm, which says, I will lift up my eyes to the mountain. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He won't let your foot slip. 
He watches over you, and he won't sleep. He's always awake. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade when you get hot. He's at your right hand. The sun won't harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life, all of it, all of it. The coming in and the going out, both now and forevermore. Please bow your heads. Lord, we thank you for the life of Margaret Oliver. She was a beautiful human being, and we lift her up to you today, Lord, because you are all-knowing, you are all-wise, and you are all-powerful. We give you the glory today. She loved you with all of her heart. And today I come asking you to give her family and her friends what she had, which was a relationship with you. So now we know she won't suffer anymore. She'll have no more pain. She's gone home to be with you, Lord. But that leaves family, it leaves friends, it leaves Bryce, it leaves Raymond. And his lifetime partner leaves all of us sad and forlorn. Heavenly Father, just wipe away the tears allow the memories, the good memories, the bowling and the harlequin novels and all of the good times on cruises. Lord, let those memories soothe and heal along with prayer and supplication, Lord. We thank you for the way that you will comfort this family and be with them, guiding them, keeping them as they go through this normal, healthy period of missing their beautiful loved one. Thank you, Lord, for all you have done in Margaret Oliver's life and for all of the legacy that is yet to come. We ask all of this in your matchless, wonderful, beautiful name. Amen, amen, and amen. Praise the Lord, saints. Uh, if y'all can do better than that, I heard some clapping earlier. Praise the Lord, saints. This is a happy homecoming, and I am humbled, and thank you, Ray. 
you want to follow along, I'll be singing How Great Thou Art in your hymnal 148. Because I know some of y'all may know the song, but, you know, you don't want to trip over the words. Amen? Mm -hmm. Everybody want to be on the Apollo. Just make sure we get it right. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, Lord, my God, when I, in awesome wonder, Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed. Verse 2, when through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees, when I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. Hallelujah. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. And when I think that God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. This is verse 4. When Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow <laughs> in humble adoration, and then proclaim, my God, how great Thou art, that was your amen moment right there. Yes, that's what that was. Then sings my soul, <laughs> my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great 
thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Amen and amen. Morgan. Whereas the hearts of the officers and members of Union Baptist Church of Hartford have been saddened by the passing of Margaret Oliver, we join with her family and friends to express, express our heartfelt sympathy and to offer our prayers for hope and strength to comfort you during this time of sorrow. Whereas Margaret was a lifelong faithful member of Union Baptist Church, where she provided Christian service as a trustee and served on the Women's Day Committee, Youth Services, Seniors, Sisters, and Sunday School Ministries. Margaret was the co-chairman of Father Abraham's Children's Church and was an advisor to the drama ministry. Her support of the HBCU ministry and serving as a chaperone for the HBCU tour was a testament to her concern for youth. Most recently, Margaret was instrumental in establishing the Grief Share Ministry. As the moderator, she provided resources and personal encouragement to those grieving. Whereas grief is the most painful of all emotions, we know you will, meet, you will need more than compassion to manage the pain of your loss. Therefore, we offer you the Lord's eternal reminders. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust him and Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Therefore, be it resolved, we will keep the family in our prayers, trusting the Lord will grant each of you comfort through his Holy Spirit. Be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution will be given to the family, signed and sealed, by the order of Union Baptist Church of Hartford on this 28th day of March in the 2024th year of our Lord, submitted with compassion and reverence, the Union Baptist Church family. Reverend Gary Knighton, interim pastor, Ronnie Thomas, chairperson, board of deacons, Joanne Price, chairperson, board of trustees, Carolyn Thomas, church clerk. Amen. Thank you, Carolyn. In this moment, we're going to have reflections uh, by members of the family and friends, coworkers, and uh, 
We know we can't sum up a person's, person's life in a few minutes, but we'll try. Um, and so we'll have those people come in their respective places and their names are in the program. service with my friend Margaret. I'm Katie Cox. I'm a member of the Insurance City Senate Bowling. And all I would like to ask all the members, past and present, who throw balls, please stand. Meadows, South Windsor, Silver Lands. Okay, thank you. And I have a point for Margaret. Margaret, we thought of you today, but that is nothing new. We thought about you yesterday and the days before that too. We think of you in silence. We often speak your name. All we have are memories and your picture in a frame. Your memory is a keepsake from which we will never part. God has you, Margaret, in his arms, and we have you in our hearts. Those we love don't go away. They walk beside us every day, unseen, unheard, but always near. Still love, still miss, and very day. Raymond and family and friends, your mom was loved by all. She leaves a great legacy behind. Isaiah 41 verses 10 says, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not dismay, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. John 14, 27 says, Peace I give to you. My peace I give to you. I do not, for, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled, and do not be afraid. Thank you. Margaret, rest in peace. Good morning to everyone. Raymond, I want to thank you for the honor of allowing me to stand here as your mom's friend and colleague. It's hard to believe that I and your mom and your Gigi Bryson spent so much time together for so many years. Yeah, we grew up at Union, this church right here, and we participated in all the youth ministries that Union had to offer. But as your mom always liked to remind me, I had some years on her. So when I was in my teens and then went off to Howard University, it wasn't until we were in our early and late 20s that our past began to place us on the life journey together for close to 50 years. Regardless of the environment we found ourselves in, we referred to one another as Miss Clark and Miss Oliver. Sometimes I would call her Margaret, sometimes I would call her Mag, Margaret Cecile, and sometimes she would call me Merle. It wasn't until Margaret's passing did it hit me that during these 50 years, Miss Margaret Cecile and I shared so much together. We shared our marriages, the birth of all our children, the challenges and triumphs of our marriages, our compassion, study, and toil of our careers as clinical social workers, our divorces, the joy we experience loving our great-grandchildren, Bryson, as well as taking care of our elderly parents or supporting one another when we have to say goodbye and grieve the loss 
of one of our parents or our loved ones. So Raymond, you guys, has been asking me for the past two and a half weeks, Ms. Clark, I only know my mom from the perspective of a son. I want to know my mom from the perspective of a friend and a colleague. Y'all, from my generation, my answer to Mr. Ray Ray was, some things, bruh, you just don't tell. <laughs> and next, you would hear, if she was here, the sound of your mom's mischievous laugh. Well, I will tell you, though, what I will tell you, though, is that there was something special about your ma and your Gigi. She was a complex woman who loved to have people around her 24-7 and had no problem letting us know the sentiments of what that meant. Your mom and your Gigi loved to have a good time and believe me, good times we had. She loved to dance. Did you know that? Now, not just dance, but dance down to the floor <laughs> and get right back up again without missing a single beat. We spent many a day together with friends, playing cards to the wee hours of the morning, to the music of Mr. Marvin Gaye, The Temptations, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Gladys Knight and the Pips. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Margaret laughed loud and long. When we came together for our mini cookouts, Kath, the five of us, Margaret, Doris, alias Dodo, Kathy, Mama Sue, and I, we held these things at our own homes, and it seemed like they would last forever. No one ever wanted to go home. We were family friends who enjoyed just being with one another and having our kids get to really grow up together. Your mom was a people person who possessed something special that many of us don't have. Your mom's personality had the power to attract a variety of different kinds of people who sometimes had nothing in common but the fact that we loved her and we enjoyed being around her. Look around you today. This is a perfect example of how folks from different perspectives of lives have come together to celebrate the life of your mom. Your mom was so proud of you, Ray Ray, Raymond, sorry, for the way you stepped up and you stood by her side. You recently took the lead, strong in your love and your care, and when she could no longer care for herself, your mom could rely on you. There's no doubt, Miss Margaret, your, your, your mother is smiling from heaven, so proud of her Ray Ray. And for the past two years, Mr. Bryson, your Gigi's goal, because I heard it all the time, was to make a book of pictures and writings so she could give to you because she wanted you to know that you had a big, big family of relatives, but also friends that loved you and would be here to support you. Margaret was a complex woman who, although for those of us who knew her complaining well, also knew she would on one hand say or do something and then say, I need help. But before it was over, <laughs> Margaret was either doing the very thing she said she couldn't do or making sure we did what she wanted 
her way. Sometimes Mag would say when we talked, ain't nothing but notion, Miss Clark. To this day, I don't have a clue what that meant. <laughs> Margaret was extremely competitive. She would always tell me, Miss Clark, if you don't play big, you don't win big. And that was related to so many of our life experiences. Not only was she competitive, she was an avid reader and a swimmer who swam year round. I'll never forget, for years we'd get up early, she, Kathy, and I, meet at Weaver High School track, jog a couple of miles before returning home to send our kids off to school, and then going to work. I'm just getting tired even thinking about it at this point. Now maybe this is what Miss Margaret Cecile meant when she said ain't nothing but a notion, I don't know. The two of us spent so much time together over the past 50 years, having so much fun, cruising the Caribbean on one of our many annual cruises, attending the National Conference of Black Social Workers, chaperoning at our, or on our annual HBCU tours, leading the church's drama ministry for more than a decade, writing, directing, and rehearsing for large productions, costumes and all, you remember Ray Ray? Where the youth felt like stars, shining their light not only at Union, but at detention homes, shelters, and schools. Your mom fulfilled her dream of implementing a grief ministry, not realizing that when we learned and what we learned and taught was preparing us for our own grief. Margaret and I were ride or die fussing friends. Margaret and I really knew how to push each other's buttons. And the fussing would begin. I'd find myself asking, Margaret, why are you saying that? And she would laugh with that mischievous look on her face and say, because you're my sister, Miss Clark can't help but love her, right? On a whim, taking our kids to the beach for impromptu cookouts, rides, and the three of us going down the tallest water slide. I like to think Margaret and I and Kathy and Doris took our traveling to a whole nother level that included organizing summer trips each year where we would gather a busload of family and friends and take week-long road trips to Virginia Beach, Dorney Park, Disney World, Cedar Point, Hershey Park, all the parks throughout the country. Mark and I were roller coaster enthusiasts who chased parks and roller coasters known to be the highest and the scariest. We loved the thrill of riding, even more than our children did. On the serious side, my sister was an experienced and dedicated clinical social worker for over 40 years. 25 of those years, she served important to the lives of hundreds of students and families at numerous schools within the Harford District. Margaret was always searching, purchasing, and implementing the newest and best materials and strategies that would engage her students and address, and address their needs. She loved them, and they loved her. Some of her closest social worker friends were, will remember the encouraging messages she would take the time to leave us on our phones just to get us through the day. Thanks, Mark. Margaret's love, hard work, integrity, and compassion to her profession, implemented with excellence, will be dearly missed and live on through the testimonies of those she served. In her earthly voice, I can hear your mom saying, what you doing now, Miss Clark? Stay out of trouble, Miss Clark. Be safe, sister. I love you, because you are my sister. I can't do much right now, Ms. Clark, but let me know how I can help. She was always by my side. 
my answer to her, you have, you've already helped. You already have, my friend. Rest in peace, my sister friend, free of pain, worry. We'll see you again soon. Amen. Good morning. Uh, my name is, as you can see, Lori Robinson. I'm the president. And I am going to share with you family. Okay. Uh, first of all, we call her Margie. And the reason we do that, because we were too young to say Margaret. So we, it's to this day, we call her this. Um, she loved tra traveling. Over the years, she went on cruises, Las Vegas, Disneyland, Hearst Castle, SeaWorld, and many other places over the years together that we've been. We, uh, she would have picnic and barbecues in the summer. She loved to swim. Uh, she was loved to swim. swim. Uh, my uncle, uh, aunt, and, and they brought the, her a pool to put in the backyard, and she was always the first one in there. <laughs> um, we spend holidays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter. We would come to the East, East Coast and be with our relatives. Um, Margie was a young woman. She also had uh, traveled to Europe in that age. My sister and I was in her, in her wedding. It was so beautiful, just beautiful. Uh, Margie learned her, her mom's coconut cake recipe. So if you haven't had it, it you know. <laughs> uh, she was a protector over her cousins. Anytime somebody was saying something in, incorrect, she just like a mama bear, you know, mama bear. And it was taken care of. <laughs> she loves her family. Um, she would help anybody, you know, whether it's relatives or people on the jobs or even children. She was always helping there, and she, she stretched and stretched and stretched her time, any time to do, to get the right thing in place. Um, and also, um, this was kind of my sister and I. Uh, Maggie loved to read romance novels, so when we were little, we say, oh, that's kissy, kissy stuff. <laughs> And she loved romance. And she's just uh, been a great cousin to us. Uh, we have so many memories that will never slip away. And that's going to be in our hearts until we see her again. Thank you. Thank you for coming, and we love you all. Good morning, everyone. 
before I get to reading this entire dissertation about my mother, it's like 40 miles, five minutes long, so I hope you guys don't have anywhere else to go. Um, I do want to say thank you for coming. Um, the fact that you're all here lets me know that I am not alone and that, you know, my mother loves you all and that you all love us. And so from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate you all for being here today. It is a difficult day. It's a difficult day, and it's been a trying past few weeks as my mother entered decline, and an even more trying past year, um, helping her face the reality of the battle she had ahead of her. And admittedly, I had all the faith in the world that this was going to be one of those things that she would go through, triumph over, and continue forward unabated by the difficulties of life. That's the luxury of faith, and that's the luxury of believing that your mother is untouchable. But God knows better. And that's a, that's a thing that I have to learn to accept and have come to accept over time. And I will come to accept further, as Deb said before. When all the calls stop, when all the cars cease, all the hands, sit, all the hands out, go back in the pockets, it will be me, my family, and my thoughts. But I remember this day and that you all took the time to be here with me, and I love you all for it. Reflection and preparation, memories and lessons, perseverance and education, life and faith. I stand here today on what is undoubtedly the most difficult day of my life as I say goodbye to my mother, my greatest friend, my toughest critic, and biggest cheerleader, Margaret Cecile Oliver. Yet still these values ring loud and true, reaching across the generations to meet me here on this day. The baton has been passed, and with its passing, I take this time to reflect. I reflect on 41 years of watching a dynamic, funny, highly educated single mother pour, all her, pour her all into making life the best it can be. My mother was a virtuous woman with flaws and perfections not everyone could see, not even me. Yet, she was the bravest woman I've ever known. And after watching, listening, and learning from her, I came to realize that my mother was immensely fearful, but infinitely hopeful. As we all know, bravery is not having a lack of fear but the will and determination to do what is right and necessary despite that fear. That is who my mother was, a woman determined to do what is right and necessary for her friends, for her family, and for herself, all because of an unyielding faith in God. And let it be known, even in her final days, that faith never wavered. Meticulous. Has anyone here today known my mother to be meticulous? If so, let me get an amen. <laughs> Margaret Oliver was the most unbelievably meticulous person I have ever known. And she was that way because she believed strongly in being prepared. Her preparations paved the way for children to be placed in loving foster homes, friends to mend fences with one another, bills to be paid on time, cruises to be experienced to the fullest, strikes to be rolled consecutively, a son to graduate college, a grandson to know he was loved, and most relevant to this moment, a funeral, this funeral to occur, because she was meticulous and made the necessary preparations. I want everyone to know that my mother's preparedness is undoubtedly her truest love language, and she loved us all very much. Memories and lessons perseverance in education. Now, for the sake of not taking up too much time, I'll weave these things together in a single memory. My mother was a stickler for teaching and educating children. And, pl and please know, I always felt like her guinea pig in that sense. <laughs> there were rarely moments when my mother wouldn't tie a life lesson into something we were doing together or if I was doing wrong. The most memorable of these, which happened 
far too often, was any time I didn't know how to spell a word. <laughs> She'd say, I'm not telling you a thing. Go grab the dictionary downstairs and look it up. Now, to most, that doesn't sound so bad, right? But let me tell you something. She might as well have told me to clean the carpet with tweezers. This dictionary was enormous. Gold, eight inches tall, when closed. And its pages were as thin as Bible paper. <laughs> Every time she'd tell me to get that dictionary, I'd think to myself, dear God, no. <laughs> but that consistent exercise was teaching me a few lessons. Lessons that I endeavor to teach my son. If you're searching for something, realize that along the way, I'm sorry, if you want something in life, do not expect it to come easy. Learn, persevere, and expect to work hard to get what you're searching for. Realize that along the way, whether you're thumbing through a 1,000 page dictionary or learning a new skill, by the time you've reached your answer, you've also learned many unexpected things along the way that only further to enrich you and prepare you for tomorrow. She believed that education is our most valuable tool. It's something that cannot be taken away and will always be the light that paves the way. Finally, life and faith. Now I know I can be a bit wordy, so I'll just say this. Margaret Cecile Oliver lived a blessed life filled with hardships and triumphs, ups and downs, that would cause many to crumble. But she trudged forward, nonetheless. And she did so because she had faith. My mother, was, my mother has been called home because for a woman who lived a good and just life as she did, her reward simply isn't one that exists here on earth. It resides in heaven, and she has gone home to claim her prize. Thank you. Amen. Such remarkable reflections really encompass how amazing her life has been and is. Thank you, Ray, for having the strength to talk about that and, and tell us and educate us. I had such a good time listening to all those stories, um, and, and it's just amazing. And even uh, Sister Clark, thank you so much for expounding on that as well. It's good to see that side of her um, as well. Um, in this moment, we're going to have a silent reading of the obituary accompanied by music. Take, we'll take a few moments and look through it. Um, and, and I would encourage you to, to read it even later, as I read it at home. Such an amazing life lived. It's full of life. And I'm so glad he didn't spare anything so we could read it, because that's how you do mama. Amen? Amen. So take a few minutes and read that. Amen.
Amen. Would you stand with me one more time? We're going to sing another hymn together. Amen. The family may remain seated. Everybody else, if you can, would you stand? Amen. And the lyrics of this song are in the hymn, are in the program. Some glad, come on, some glad morning, I fly away to a home on God's celestial shores, I fly away. you put your hands together right there and give God praise. Amen. Thank God. We will fly away together one day. And though shall we ever be with our Lord. Listen, I have a few minutes to preach to you, to celebrate her life before we get ready for committal. Listen, first, before I say anything else, I want to share my deepest condolences with with the family. Um, It has been a pleasure and an honor to serve her in this season of her life. I did not get to know her as long as you all have known her, but I've got to know her enough to love her, and that's what's most important. Um, I was telling Raymond that she was one of the first people that I met here Uh, when I came to Union. Um, And uh, I met her outside on my second day of work here. And I was introduced. I can't remember who it was who introduced me at the time. I think it was Trustee Price. And she introduced me. She said, you got to meet Miss Oliver. You got to meet Miss Oliver. And so I I met Miss Oliver. and She was was there. She had her mask on. And she pulled it down. And she talked to me. and, And I was telling her I was just coming to check out the event. Uh, we were having a Christmas uh, marketplace event. And she said to me, she said, Pastor, you hungry? I said, yeah, I could eat. You know, I could eat. I'm hungry. 
Um, and uh, she said, I'm going to buy you lunch. I said, oh, you sure? I said, you got to buy me lunch. She said, I'm going to buy you lunch. I said, okay. And so she went in there, and uh, she said, give the, give the pastor what you want. Now, at first, the kitchen staff is so thorough. They didn't really believe it at first. Marlene, you were there. Marlene, you were there, right? And, uh, she, you know, she, they, I had to get my, go and get my ticket because at first they, didn't, they wouldn't give me this fish sandwich. And she said, no, 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 put the pastor on my, on my tab. And, uh, and so she gave the fish name, and we sat down, and we ate, and we talked. And that was the first day I, I met uh, Sister Mike. And uh, it's been a blessing to know her ever since. And I think what's, what's interesting for me is that, you know, she just welcomed me. She just wrapped her arms around me, and she literally became one of my favorites immediately. You know, when I was on vacation, I would think about her. I would make sure I call her, even on a ride going home, just to check on to see how she was doing, just to see how she would feel, because she was one at the time who was on the sick and shut-in list but wasn't really shut in. You know, you look around, and Sister Margaret would be sitting right over there. And I'd be like, I thought she was on the sick and shut-in list. But she, she wouldn't let that sickness shut her in. She would come if she could. When she felt all right, she would be here. So... I just want to thank you all for letting me know her for that time that, I w- that the Lord allowed us to know each other. I mean, it's my prayer that the Lord continues to walk with you and that you would feel his love and comfort in ways unknown in the days, months, and years to come as you navigate this new normal. Also to Margaret's friends and coworkers and fellow Delta sisters, um, her soras, uh, and honoring her and sharing to support this family in their grief and your own grief as well. Thank you for helping us celebrate her life and celebrate her legacy. Also to our church family, this is a loss uh, that we are truly feeling as a church body. Uh, Sister Margaret was one of us. She was a lifelong member of this church. Um, I think that's amazing that she she would often tell the story. I was reading that she would often tell the story of people, how my family came up on the boxcar all the way from the south, from Essex, right, all the way, yeah, and it would come all, came all the way up here and started a church in the boxcar. She was proud to say that she was a lifelong member of Union Baptist Church. And so, you know, it hurts, and we are her church family. This was her church, and one thing that she would encourage you to do if she was here right now, she'd encourage you to grieve, because that was her ministry. She encouraged people to address their grief to go through those stages, not to ignore it, but to embrace it. And she would tell you that you should grieve, but we don't grieve as the world grieves because we have hope. And so grieve, and you should also know for us and those who know the Lord, this is not goodbye, this is see you later. And for me, it's also impactful because I also realized one sermon, because I always tell stories when I start speaking, that I'm a bowler. And so she put two and two together. And she said, oh, I know your grandfather. I said, yeah? She said, yeah, Fred Knight. And I know. I said, oh, man. Yeah. And then I, I thought when I had saw Ray, I said, Ray looked familiar because we all bowled in the junior league together. And I was like, man, ain't that amazing that we was all a part of the same community. And I see faces I know right now from when I was a kid, five years old, bowling at the Meadows. Because I had to tell the church, if you were planning on taking the pastor out to the lanes, it ain't going to be a good day for you. <laughs> it's, it's, this is not a joke for me. My shoes and my ball are in the car. <laughs> Amen. In fact, I have Mr. Trotman's ball with me all the time. I still roll it down those lanes. So it's a family affair when we go back to the lanes. Amen. And so listen, uh, let me give you a few things to encourage you while we have a little bit more time, just a few moments. If you could turn your Bibles or grab your phone with me, I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians, the first, uh, first chapter, the third through the seventh verse. I'll be reading from the NIV. It says, Praise be to God, to the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our trouble so that we can comfort those in any trouble 
with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as we share in abundant, abundantly in the suffering of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. And if we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same suffering we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you will share in our comfort. Let me pray real quick. Father, thank you so much for your word. Your word is a lamp into our feet and a light unto our path. Because of your word, we know where to go when, when times are dark. Line up our path today. Give us hope and help, God. So many came today looking for hope. We need to, you to be the lifter of our head. Help us through this next season of life. And we'll give you praise, God. Give me preaching power both to be accurate and to be precise and to be concise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For these few moments which I'm mine to share with you, I want to give you the title for, your, for this message, The Climax of Comfort. The Climax of Comfort. Permit me to share a few things about the text with you really quickly. God, first thing is God, is the Father of all compassion. He comforts us in all of our troubles. He comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort other people in their troubles. Comfort is divine in its origin, yet distributed and disseminated by humans. God the Father who is, God the Father is the consolation, and the comfort is where comfort and consolation begins, and it makes its way by, uh, by, through us to those who receive it and pass it along. The comfort that God gives us in our trouble and is the reason we are going to offer praise even in a moment like this. So when the, psalm, when the author says, praise be God, he praises God because God is the one who brings comfort. Number two is that as believers, we share in the sufferings of Christ. We endure hardship. We go through persecution, through ridicule, even spiritual attack because we have aligned ourselves with Christ. And this is no small thing because suffering in the life of a Christian is abundant. But thanks be unto God because his comfort abounds and it super abounds over our distress. Number three, the apostle Paul shares that what is happening in the life of the believer, whether it is distress or comfort, is all meant for the people we are called to serve. God in every circumstance is making our pain productive. Give you a few points to leave you with that you can hold on to for the days, weeks, months, and years to come. The first point is this. God has a plan for our suffering and our comfort that goes beyond us. When we go through suffering and when we have trouble, God is faithful to comfort us as the father of all comfort. The comfort and consolation he sends is for us. The comfort and consolation he sends is for us, but not only for us. It is for others. See, Margaret knew this, and she knew it well. She lived a full life. She enjoyed cruises, swimming, bowling, hanging out with Raymond and her grandson and her loved ones, and she loved serving at her church. But she also lived a life of comforting and advocating for the least and most broken people in our community and our society. She took her full life and the comforts that God gave her to provide comfort for other people. Even in high school, she served on a team of younger women who were given blood drives. Even from her early years, she knew that what God was blessing her with was something she had to give to other people. She has demonstrated for us that receiving comfort from God does not stop at us, but starts with us. And should flow through us to other people in need of support and advocacy. Margaret showed us that it's not about us but it's about other people. See, even while she was facing her own transition, she was deeply concerned in our phone calls and our hospital visits and making sure that the grief ministry of the church would continue on after her because she knew that people would need God's comfort for what was ahead of their, in their life. God today, just like he did for Margaret, has a plan for our suffering and for our suffering to result in the comfort and the blessing of other people. 
Number two is this, and this one gets me happy, so don't mind me if I get happy a little bit. Number two is when suffering increases, so does comfort. Yeah, that's good. When suffering increases, so does God's comfort. Today, we bear witness to the faithfulness of the Father of all compassion and the God of all comfort. As Margaret's suffering increased, so did God's comfort for her. During my visits with Margaret, you could see her being worried and discomforted both physically and emotionally about what was ahead of her, about the unknown or where she would go. She did not want to be alone by herself. She had a lot of anxiety in those moments, but when we would pray and when we would read scripture, I would sit there and see her fall asleep like a baby. And I would read to her, and if I would look over a little while later, even in the noisy emergency room, Margaret would sleep. And she wouldn't always sleep when you gave her medicine, but she would sleep when we prayed and when we read the word. You see, she was going through, God was super abounding in her suffering to give her peace when her mind was stayed on him. But suffering increased even more. But God's comfort increased even more. That on Sunday, March 17, at 7.05, God's comfort overshadowed her suffering. And when suffering had reached its breaking point, God lifted her up to ultimate comfort. That's good. That's a shout point right there. And now Margaret is enjoying unfathomable comfort in the presence of her God. There is no more suffering. There is no more pain. There is no more worry and there is no more anxiety. All of her questions and all of her answers have been answered as she looked in the face of Jesus. She has no more worries and she has no more cares because she has met the God of all comfort. She has met the God of all consolation. Great C.S. Lewis said that when you meet Jesus, he is the great iconoclast. That every problem, every question you had erodes away as you look at the face of the one who has all of the answers. And see, knowing this truth right here, watch this, this is good, because knowing this truth gives us comfort today. It gives us comfort because we don't, we're not guessing where Margaret is. We're not guessing if she's suffering, but we know that she's resting in the arms of Jesus and that God's comfort is overwhelming and abundant and abounding in her life. Number three is this, God's comfort has come to you so you can keep going. God uses our trials and our suffering to grow us and produce character in us and to take us into the next chapter of our life. And God in his infinite wisdom used this last bout of suffering to transport Sister Oliver to the next season of her life. I want you to understand that she is not dead, that she is yet alive. In fact, Sister Margaret is living more than she has ever lived. She's living better than any cruise she could ever go on. Now she's cruising through the skies. She, 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 she's not just playing a game of spades into the night. No, she's sitting at the right hand of the Father. She's enjoying the company of the saints and Jesus. She's having a good time. I'm sure because it's heaven and heaven is good. I'm sure she's rolling a strike right down and the ball ain't coming up high. It's coming right into the pocket. She's having a good time and she's not worried because she knows that her Redeemer liveth. Jesus asked the same question to Lazarus. He said, do you, and Lazarus' sister said, do you believe this, that I am the resurrection, the truth, and the life? Nobody, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Nobody dies in Jesus. They just live again. See, and this hope that we have for her is firm. We have no questions about where she is or what she's doing. We know she's with the Lord and in his care. It is our job now to let our trials, to let this grief bring us closer to God, 
to grow in our wisdom and understanding, to mature in our character so that we can all be together in heavenly bliss. She has fought the good fight of faith, and she has won. I told her at her bedside, when she was making some decisions that were very critical, I said, it doesn't matter what you decide, Margaret, because you already won. When you decided to make Jesus your Lord, you already won the test. Whatever happens after this, God's got it covered. So she has already won. So what are we to do then? Well, first thing is this. Find someone to comfort. The comfort that you have received from God came to you, but it shouldn't stop at you. As you go through your world, do what Margaret did. Find the least and the lowly, people who don't have a voice, and be the voice for them. Comfort them in their affliction. You know somebody right now who's hurting. Why don't you go give them the comfort that you received from the time that you were hurting? The second thing is this. Expect to receive comfort as troubles rise. Listen, as the troubles of life and the vicissitudes of life come upon you, I need you to live with expectation that God will meet you in the middle of your comfort, I mean, the middle of your suffering, and he will give you comfort that doesn't just uh, come near to it. The Bible declares that it super abounds. So if life is life in, God will be God in that moment. And lastly, and I hope you hear me well, no matter what you do, keep going. Because the Lord has given you comfort not to just be comfortable, but to keep on moving. He's given you comfort so that you don't stop. Because it's not about us. It's about him. It's about people who need the comfort in their suffering. And when you're a leader, you realize that what's happening to you isn't just happening to you. It's happening for you. And if you really mature, you understand it's not just happening for me. It's happening for them. So whether it's good times or bad, God wants to use it for his glory. Let me pray. Father, we thank you, we love you, and we adore you. God, thank you for being the God of all consolation and comfort. Thank you, Lord, for being a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Thank you, Lord, that we have comfort in you that we don't look to anyone else for comfort because comfort originates from you. But you use us human beings to pass comfort along. So I pray, God, that we'd find someone to comfort today and that we'd be comforted by your grace. But more importantly, God, I re help us to remember, remember that when grace, when grace shows up in our life, God, it will superabound all of our sufferings, that he will give us strength for our journey. God, hopefully, God, and lastly, God, that you help us to understand, God, that is, we've given comfort, not to sit and be idle, but to keep on working. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I now turn my hands of our funeral director. Good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the family, I'd like to thank you all for being here today and the kindness and comfort you've given them in their time of need. And just as Pastor said, please keep these wonderful, beautiful people in your spirit and in your heart and remember them um, because they will need your prayers moving forward. I'd like to personally thank Pastor Knighton for his words of prayer and comfort as well. Um, my first opportunity to meet Pastor was this morning, and he's such a beautiful, wonderful spirit. And um, I connected with his gentleness and his kindness and the love and comfort in his voice, which I'm sure was comforting for Margaret as well um, on, in her time of need. And I, I need Pastor to be on my Calm app now because <laughs> I want him to, to talk me to sleep that night. Sounds wonderful. What a beautiful memory we have of your mom, and we appreciate that. And thank you for inviting me into your life as well. 
Um, it's been a pleasure getting to know you and your family and everybody so well, and your mom through your memories. She was a beautiful, wonderful spirit. Um, I remember when my mom was always so proud of us as kids when she met with our teachers and our teachers would say, if, if I had a whole classroom full of your children, it would be a better environment for me. And what a beautiful world the place would be if everybody was like your mom, if we had an entire world full of Margarets. You know, honestly, what a better world we would all live in. And please, as Pastor said too, take the time to read the obituary because it is a beautiful reflection of her life and the person that she was. And I always tell people, live your life the way you want somebody to write your obituary. And that's a perfect example. So you did your mother a great service, and you're a great son, and I can tell that. You carry her beauty and her calmness and her strength inside of you. And I'm sure you've passed that off to your son as well. He's a beautiful kid. So thank you for inviting me into your lives also. If you're coming with us to the cemetery, we are going to um, be in a funeral procession, which not everybody's going to be respectful of. So we're going to go as slowly as we possibly can. You're going to uh, put your high beams on and your emergency flashers. And please follow as closely to the car in front of you as safety will permit. We'll be rolling through some intersections, but you won't get lost. So um, please just follow us very carefully because your safety is of our utmost concern as well. Thank you, Pastor, for inviting us into your home today and into God's home to celebrate the life of Margaret today. You are invited back here to uh, Union Baptists, to the reception area, to continue faith and fellowship and, and have a meal um, with Raymond and his family and to continue to celebrate uh, Margaret's life. If you were asked to be a pallbearer today, that's a privilege and an honor to be asked that. And our staff will give you direction if you'd like to come forward you are going to be um, behind pastor and in front of the casket. So at this time, I'd like everybody to stand up, please, and give us just a moment to head out to the parking lot, and then give us a little bit of your time as we get ready to follow to the cemetery. We are going to Mountain View Cemetery, and uh, we'll get there as slowly and, and as carefully as we can. Thank you so much.